Uh, thank you so much, Petar. Um, I just want to say it's such an incredible gift to, uh, to have had Mama translate those two books in this beautiful edition, and um, I appreciate it so much. It's a very rare thing. And I'll say also that it was Petar who interpolated me in a way to, uh, to write this book on Baudelaire, because when I was done with rationalist empiricism, I was thinking about what to do next, and Petar said, ah, oh, well, maybe you'll write something on a, on a single author now. And that's what ended up happening with the, the Baudelaire book. Um, so this is an extension of, um, in that book, I didn't write all that much about one of Baudelaire's greatest poems, uh, Le Signe, The Swan, and, um, and so I'm giving myself an opportunity to do that here. So the title is, I think, changed a little bit from the conference program, The Flowers of Andromache, Allegory and the Ontological Difference in Le Signe. The basic operation of Baudelaire's allegorical style is disarmingly simple. He confers a majuscule upon an abstract noun, thus stamping it with the mark of the universal and personifying it as an agent that may be addressed through the rhetoric of apostrophe, as in the poem Hymn to Beauty. Do you fall from the heavens or rise from the abyss, O beauty? Yet, this apparently simple operation implies a redoubling of the given, which is more metaphysically complex. Conceived under the implicit sign of an allegorical name, every beautiful thing implies the presence of beauty with a capital B. Every instance of boredom or tedium vitae suggests the existence of ennui with a capital E. In Le Signe, one of Baudelaire's most important poems, in part because it implies a theory of allegory, the three allegorical figures are work, sorrow, and memory, so travail, douleur, and souvenir. Work awakens at the cold and clear hour when the street cleaners carry out their task. Sorrow is described as a gracious she-wolf um, who nurses those who have lost what cannot be found and who drink their own tears. And in the final stanza, memory rises within the forest of my mind's exile where it sounds a full-throated horn. So the allegorical names of work, sorrow, and memory punctuate the movement of the poem and populate it with figures that represent the social reproduction of the city while rising above it, and that commemorate the suffering of exiles as a collective. But the poem also involves another allegorical level. It constructs a historical and mythopoetic allegory, wherein the transformation of Paris by Baron Haussmann's renovation in the 1850s evokes the fall of Troy mapping the melancholic mood of the speaker onto the sufferings of Andromache and the death of Hector. So one of the interpretive demands imposed by the poem is to understand the relationship between these two levels of allegorical meaning. At the center of the poem, we find the association through rhyme of melancholy and allegory that will be so crucial to Walter Benjamin's theory of Baroque allegory in the Trauerspiel book. So I'll, I'll read in English for these, but the French is there. Paris changes, but nothing in my melancholy has stirred. New palaces, scaffoldings, blocks, old neighborhoods. For me, everything becomes allegory, and my cherished memory is more weighty than rocks. Written in 1859, and following Baudelaire's earlier evocation of the reconstruction of uh, the Place du Carousel, the passage articulates a melancholic attachment to the city of his youth. The Paris of old is no more. The form of a city changes more swiftly, alas, than the human heart. Thus, the transformation of the old Paris by Haussmann's modern renovation gives rise to a meditation upon the differential rhythm or chronology of historical and subjective time. The disjunction between these gives rise to melancholy, and the stasis of such melancholy uh, amid the mutability of the city confers allegorical significance upon its inorganic elements, new palaces, scaffoldings, blocks, neighborhoods, while turning the affective intimacy of cherished memories to stone. Allegory, quote, allegories are in the realm of thought what ruins are in the realm of things, writes Benjamin. In Baudelaire's quatrain, the melancholic attunement of thought converts things into allegory and memories into ruins. But how exactly does the disjunction between historical and subjective temporality relate to Baudelaire's practice of allegory, in which abstract nouns are personified as universals? And what does the kind of temporality at issue here have to do with the attachment of thinking, 
in the iconic apostrophe that opens Baudelaire's poem, Andromache, I think of you, Andromache, je pense à vous. Um, so what does this, the kind of temporality at issue have to do with the attachment of thinking um, to this apostrophe? These questions are well-trodden ground, and the centrality of Le Signe to modern literature and literary theory is such that these or similar questions are inextricable from Benjamin's theory of the dialectical image, Paul de Mon's essay on allegory as the rhetoric of temporality, and Frederick Jameson's understanding of allegory's relationship to ideology, um, which situates the subject within a collective social structure. With Benjamin de Mon and Jameson in mind, one notes that the poem's opening invocation of Andromache performs the recuperative gesture of linking the transformation of the modern city to ancient myth, honorifically compensating for the lyric speaker's subjective powerlessness in the fact of historical change and its social consequences, a powerlessness that had been driven home for Baudelaire by the violent suppression of the revolution of 1848 and the bathos of the subsequent coup d'etat. Recalling a figure from ancient epic and drama, Modern lyric here bathes the brute facticity of material power in the light of a classical ideal of melancholic fidelity, bestowing archetypal meaning upon historical contingency and subjective defeat. In the image of the swan, to which we will return, Baudelaire produces a correlate of Andromache adequate to both the nobility of her pathos and the degraded conditions of modernity. And I want to sharpen these questions about the temporality of melancholic allegory and their relationship to the figure of Andromache by asking about the transcendental conditions of this kind of figuration. What are the conditions of possibility for that cognitive act which stamps an abstract noun with the significance of the universal? And for that act of imagination which relates this allegorical gesture to a mythic figure through the sign of a proper name? How does the temporality of these figurative gestures partake of those conditions of possibility? These questions may take us behind or beneath, as it were, those theories of allegory produced by Benjamin, Damon, and Jameson, illuminating the ontological ground of their reference to temporality and to history. But to see how and why that is the case, we have to start over again by looking into the Homeric scene in which Andromache becomes the melancholic figure that she will be in Baudelaire's poem. The opening of Le Signe uh, recalls not Homer so much as, as Virgil. So this is the opening of the poem. Andromache, I think of you, this little stream, poor and sad mirror, where once reflected the immense majesty of your widow's grief, this duplicitous simoise swelled by your tears, suddenly made fecund my fertile memory as I was crossing the new carousel. The Andromache that Baudelaire is thinking of is described in book three of the Aeneid, where Aeneas finds her in a grove beside a stream, quote, offering her yearly feast and gifts of mourning to the dust and calling the ghost to Hector's tomb, the empty mound of green, of green turf that she had hallowed with twin altars there to shed her tears. The stream beside which she makes her offering is referred to uh, by Baudelaire as Cecimoise Monteur and by Virgil as Falsi Simuentis. Uh, so Falsi, which I've translated as duplicitous from Monteur, a lying Simoise. Um, that is, a false and diminished double of the river Simoise on the Trojan plain. By now, after having for years been a slave and concubine to Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, and having been forced to bear his children, Andromache has passed after his death into the hands of Hellenus, a Trojan, who has established a so-called little Troy in Greece to the imagined of Aeneas when he, when he finds her. And this is a sequence compressed into Baudelaire's other reference to Andromache in the second half of the poem, where she is described as fallen from the arms of a mighty husband, lowly chattel under the sway of haughty Pyrrhus, bowed in a trance beside an empty tomb, widow of Hector, alas, and wife of Hellenus. Andromache is the widow of a mighty husband. She is the slave of Pyrrhus and now the wife of Hellenus, a poor substitute for the Trojan hero she first married, Hector the Glorious, breaker of horses, scourge of the Achaeans. 
The chronology of this sequence situates us in the Virgilian context after the Homeric epics, that is Baudelaire's passage, um, and subsequent to the moment depicted by the plays of Euripides and Racine, in which we find Andromache under the sway of haughty Pyrrhus prior to his murder by Orestes. But what can we learn from the moment at which Andromache first becomes what she will always be thereafter, widow of Hector, a moment that already encapsulates the melancholic temporality that Baudelaire will evoke when he thinks of her. The scene is narrated with crushing pathos in book 22 of the Iliad. Hector remains alone outside the gates of Troy after the Trojan army has retreated within the battlements. Achilles closes in on him and begins to chase Hector around the walls of the city, but is unable to close the distance between them. As in a dream, a man is not able to follow one who runs from him, nor can the runner escape, nor the other pursue him. So he could not run him down in his speed, nor the other get clear. The scene is locked in a state of temporal stasis, as if they were standing still, or as if they might run for all eternity at infinite speed. Achilles, the demigod, and Hector with the aid of Apollo, who has lightened his knees. But Zeus has granted Athena's wish to send Hector to his fate. And disguised as his comrade, Athena runs alongside him and persuades him to stand and fight. Achilles then drives a spear through Hector's throat, taunts him as he dies, strips off his armor, and drags his body around the walls of Troy behind his chariot. A cloud of dust rose where Hector was dragged, his dark hair falling about him, and all that head that was once so handsome was tumbled in the dust, since by this time Zeus had given him over to his enemies to be defiled in the land of his fathers. Hector's mother and father look on from the battlements during this scene, and Hecabe leads the women of Troy in a chant of sorrow. But all this time, Andromache has been at her loom, unaware of what, what is taking place uh, of what is taking place outside the city. So she spoke in tears. Hector says, or sorry, Homer says, of Hecabe's lament, but the wife of Hector had not yet heard. For no sure messenger had come to her and told her how her husband had held his ground there outside the gates. But she was weaving a web in the inner room of the high house, a red folding robe and inworking elaborate figures. She called out through the house to her lovely haired handmaidens to set a great cauldron over the fire so that there would be hot water for Hector's bath as he came back out of the fighting. Poor innocent, nor knew how, far from the waters for bathing. Pallas Athena had cut him down at the hands of Achilles. She heard from the great bastion the noise of mourning and sorrow. Her limbs spun, and the shuttle dropped from her hand to the ground. It's Lattimore's translation. Andromache's solitude in the inner room of the high house is contrasted with the communal mourning of the women on the walls, and the pathos of the scene is constructed through a riven temporality. Events taking place at the same time may be spatially divided and thus belatedly registered through deferred <coughs> recognition. Intertextually, the scene looks both forward and backward. It anticipates Penelope's weaving in the Odyssey, where the comic resolution of that epic reverses the telos of Andromache's tragic labor. It also recalls uh, Helen's weaving in Book Three of the Iliad, where she works scenes of battle into a tapestry even as, unbeknownst to her, Hector has achieved a temporary truce between Trojans and Achaeans outside the walls of, uh, outside the walls of Troy. In Richard Lattimore's translation, both Helen and Andromache are weaving a red folding robe, but the Greek in each case is diplakas porphyrin, um, where porphyrin refers to royal purple, uh, and diplakas refers to specifically to a double folded cloak, so large enough to be wrapped around twice. The color is the same as the fine, fine purple fabric spread before Agamemnon as he returns to the house of Atreus after the Trojan War. And the family of adjectives to which diplakas belongs describes that which is twofold more generally. Uh, so pairs or twins, things doubled or two-sided, an ambivalent or equivalent story, feelings of doubt or indecision, or also duplicity of conduct. 
The time of Andromache's weaving extends retroactively across the scenes of pursuit, battle, desecration, and lamentation that we have witnessed, and also forward to the punctual moment at which she, quote, hears the noise of mourning uh, and her, sorry, hears the noise of mourning and sorrow, her limbs spun and the shuttle drop from her hand to the ground. Hector's death means that the red folding robe will remain unfinished and he will never take the bath prepared from him since he is far from the waters for bathing. As the shuttle falls to the ground, the, inter the interruption of Andromache's weaving occurs after, yet doubles, the moment at which death and fate catch up with her husband. Lattimore's translation has Andromache in working elaborate figures as she weaves. The Greek is ende throna poikil epase, um, glossed by Gregory Nagy as in working varied patterns of flowers, where throna refers to floral patterns. Tracing the relationship between the adjective poikila, varied, and the verb poikilin, which refers to pattern weaving, uh, Nagy argues that Andromache's inworking of patterns amid her weaving figures the pattern weaving of Homeric narrative, in which the intersection of proleptic and analeptic implications constructs a double folded temporality um, of anticipated recollections and recollected anticipations. Andromache's weaving recalls Helen's while the temporary truce of which Helen was unaware comes to retroactively anticipate double and ironically invert um, Andromache's unawareness of Hector's death. The elsewhere of simultaneity in both of these scenes, what happens inside and outside the city walls, is the spatial double of a temporal exteriority of the not yet and the already inscribed in the narrative structure of the epic, its pattern weaving. What is happening here and now is marked as the present through its simultaneous simultaneity with something happening elsewhere at the same time. But the simultaneity of this at the same time as a construction of the present is made structurally necessary by the differential temporality of anticipation and recollection, by the exteriority of the now. It is because the now is outside of itself, is never present, that it has to be marked in its passage through the operation of a spatial doubling, the simultaneity of here and there. The pattern weaving of the double folded cloak may be taken as a figure of this spatio-temporal operation. As the shuttle drops and her weaving leaves off, Andromache begins to catch up with her own fate. Quote, I heard the voice of Hector's honored mother, she tells her handmaidens. And now, she says, my own heart rising beats in my mouth. My limbs under me are frozen. Surely some evil is near for the children of Priam, she continues. And as she speaks out the prophecy of a death that has already happened, she hopes not to hear her own voice. Quote, may what I say never come close to my ear. Andromache is double to herself, beside herself amid the double temporality of melancholic prophecy, as Cassandra, her, as Cassandra will also be outside the house of Atreus. The flowers she has been weaving are what Baudelaire will call les fleurs de mal, even as they express her innocence, her not yet knowing, their pattern bodes ill. Andromache's proleptic dread at hearing the voice of Hecabe anticipates an evil which is then confirmed by a moment of vision um, that gives way to blindness. But when she came to the bastion where the men were gathered, she stopped, staring on the wall, and she saw him being dragged in front of the city and the running of horses dragged him at random toward the hollow ships of the Achaeans. The darkness of night misted over the eyes of Andromache. Only at this moment in the scene, when she knows she has become a widow, is Andromache named in Lattimore's translation. But she is not named at all in the Greek. Throughout the entire 77 lines of the scene in which she appears, as she speaks with her handmaidens, rushes to the wall, mourns Hector's death, anticipates the unhappy childhood of their son Astyanax, and imagines the desecration and decomposition of Hector's body, Andromache's name never appears in the Greek text, even as the names of Hector, Athena, Achilles, Priam, Astyanax, and Aphrodite all pass through the narrative discourse. First, she is referred to as Hector's wife, and then as a widowed mother. In between, at the very moment when she sees Hector's body and the darkness of night mists over her eyes, the proper name is held in abeyance. 
It is as if the temporal, the temporal chasm opened by death holds open the empty place of the generic figure of the widow of sorrow and memory. This is the form of the figure that we find in Euripides, in Virgil, and in Racine, and also in Baudelaire's poem, The Swan, where the name inaugurates the modern lyrics recollection of ancient, emic, of ancient epic. So attending to book 22 of the Iliad allows us to register how the riven temporality of Homer's epic narrative involves a drama of the name where it is precisely the absence of the proper name and drama key that marks a change of state from wife to widow, a transformation that will seal thereafter the significance of the name itself, that is, what it means to say and drama key, I think of you. I mean to imply and eventually to argue that this relationship between riven temporality, punctual transformation, and the drama of the name has something to do with Baudelaire's allegorical style where the capitalization of abstract nouns marks the gathering up of particulars into figures of the universal, such as work, sorrow, and memory. But close attention to Homer um, also allows us to recognize that Baudelaire's opening apostrophe, Andromaque, je pense à vous, performs not only an invocation of Andromache, but also the displacement of another name, that of her dead husband. Um, in Andromache's own apostrophic address to Hector, um, which occurs just after she sees his dead body below the walls, so just after this passage. Hector, I grieve for you. Um, this section begins in Lattimore's translation, and the Greek is Hector ego dustenos, where dustenos means unhappy, unfortunate, wretched, or miserable. Um, so a more direct translation would be Hector, I am unhappy. Hector, I am unhappy. Andromache, I think of you. I think of your unhappiness, of the immense majesty of your widow's grief. In the Iliad, the absence of the name marks the place where wife of Hector becomes widowed mother. In Baudelaire's lyric, where Andromache is the first word of the poem from which his thinking stems, her name takes the place of the dead husband who is also a dead father. And here we see Baudelaire located in the place of Astyanax, whose name means Lord of the City. Um, and whose broken childhood Andromache's apostrophic speech will go on to mourn in advance. As the absent name of the widowed mother displaces the name of the dead father, Astyanax becomes the absent name, never articulated in Baudelaire's poem, of the I who thinks, the silent name of the melancholic son. The double-folded absence of the name would mark the place of a double displacement, where the name of the widowed mother conjoins the dead father to the voice of the disinherited son. And even to this day, Baudelaire remains the lord of the city of Paris, since it is literature that enables the transmigration of souls. But my point is that when the lyric I thinks of Andromache, it thinks of Hector as well. And we could even say that the displaced name of the father is transfigured into the title of the poem, Le Signe. This word would be, or sorry, this would be one sense in which the title is the sign as well as the swan. Like the desecrated body of Hector, Baudelaire's swan is far from the waters for bathing, exiled from its native lake uh, and bathing its wings in the dust of a waterless gutter. The swan's convulsive neck cruelly recalls the unarmored throat of Hector through which Achilles drives his spear. As the lyric speaker recalls the menagerie from which the swan had escaped long ago, his invocation of the street cleaners suggests the cloud of dust rising as Hector is dragged around the walls of Troy behind a chariot. One referential complex flickers allegorically with its evocation of another. There I saw one morning at the hour when under the sky cold and clear work awakens when the street cleaners drive a somber storm in the silent <coughs> air a swan that had escaped its cage. Here are the first of the poem's three allegorical names, Travai, appears just as the somber storm of dust might recall the desecration of Hector's body. Thus it also recalls, I think it's justified by that complex to say, the simultaneous scene of domestic labor inside the walls of the city where Andromache works at her weaving. And we might note that the work of craft and artistic production, weaving figures of flowers, doubles that of the poet, who observes the street cleaners as he meanders through the city gathering materials for his verse, quote, sniffing every corner for the chance of rhyme, stumbling over words like paving stones, as Baudelaire puts it in Le Soleil. 
in Lacine, the temporal disjunction between the pace at which the city and the heart change, between the transformation of Paris and the stasis of melancholy, is the rift wherein everything becomes allegory. Where everything perceived maps onto the strange and fatal myth evoked by the exiled swan, and where every material element of the city comes to signify such essences as travail, douleur, and souvenir. So here we, ret we return to the two allegorical levels of the poem that I mentioned at, at the beginning. One, mapping the modern city onto classical epic, the transformation of Paris onto the fall of Troy, and the other emerging from the elements of this allegory, producing allegorical names of abstract universals, which traverse and conjoin the ancient and the modern. Now, Benjamin, after both Durer and Baudelaire, uh, theorizes the melancholic production of allegory as a mode of perception whereby, quote, the profane world is both elevated in rank and devalued. So this, of course, is from the, the Trauerspiel book. So it's the profane world is elevated by virtue of pointing to something other, raised to a higher plane and thus sacralized, but it's also de devalued by virtue of the sense that, as Benjamin puts it, quote, any person, any object, any relation can signify any whatever. So there's a loss of determinacy. That is, there's a st the state in which everything becomes allegory is one in which every person or object, thus every name, marks the place of a possible substitution and is thus related not only in its concrete determinacy, um, but also as an empty place or a placeholder. My question is, what is the ground of this allegorical operation of the melancholic subject? What are the conditions of possibility for this act of imagination? We can put this in Kantian terms before then interrogating the ground of those terms as well. What is at issue here is how the cognition of a determinate object also requires the generic presupposition of an object in general. The transcendental something equals x Allegory involves a kind of double vision, wherein this generic place of the object is sustained beneath the determinacy of its concept as the place of its possible transformation into something else. Note that this implies the metonymic ground of all metaphorical identity uh, theorized by Lacan. Behind the identity swan equals Hector or Andromache equals exile lies the operation whereby the concept of an object is held in place while substituted for another, such that these may be superimposed in relation of identity, or such that a universal may stand in for a multiplicity of particulars, the universal sorrow traversing the particular sorrow of any individual. The substitution of one thing for another implies this relation between empirical and transcendental levels of determination, constituting and holding, as if beneath its determinacy, the empty place of a name, an image, or a thing. Yet, understanding the relation of allegory to melancholy at the core of Baudelaire's poem requires us to go beyond Kant through a theoretical framework conjoining the transcendental constitution of objects with a theory of how the exteriority of temporal disjunction, the misalignment of subjective and uh, historical time, is related to the determinacy of moods. It is at this level that I think Heidegger's reading of Kant, which subtends the whole project of being in time, in my opinion, uh, becomes essential. In particular, it's Heidegger's displacement of the transcendental unity of apperception through a radicalization of the, tempor of the temporality of imagination that will enable not only a transcendental but also an ontological understanding of the melancholic production of allegorical signs. Though Benjamin is frequently at pains to dissociate himself from Heidegger, I would argue that Heidegger's theory of ecstatical temporalization is a logical condition of intelligibility for Benjamin's theory of allegory. Benjamin's most famous fragment on dialectical images uh, in Convolute N begins with a, a parenthetical dismissal of Heidegger. Uh, quote, what distinguishes images from the essences of phenomenology is their historical index, says Benjamin, and then in parentheses, Heidegger seeks in vain to rescue history for phenomenology abstractly through historicity, Geschichtlichkeit. So Heidegger's theory of Geschichtlichkeit, however, so that was Benjamin, is you know, necessarily abstract insofar as it's concerned with the conditions of possibility for any historical index, whatever. And this has less to do with an opportunistic effort to rescue history for phenomenology 
than with determining the ground of any methodological orientation towards history. Benjamin argues that, quote, it is not that what is past casts its light on what is present or that what is present its light on what is past. Rather, image is that wherein what has been comes together in a flash with the now to form a constellation. These famous passages from Convolute N. According to Benjamin, such a dialectical image, dialectics at a standstill, is, quote, not temporal in nature, but figural, unquote. So what's at stake here is nothing less than the temporality of figuration, which is denied. But what is the ground of the distinction between what has been and the now, such that they can come together in a flash? And what enables this condition of possibility to be related to a form of intuition in which, as Benjamin puts it regarding allegorical perception, any person, any object, any relation um, can signify any other whatever, <clears throat> unquote. Now, one might note that the unity of what has been with the now is itself a temporal determination, namely simultaneity. What Benjamin seems to mean is that the image is not determined by temporal succession, such that the past and the present are imminently unified in the dialectical image. But the coming together of what has been with the now in a composition, that is the constellation, depends upon holding together reciprocal relations in what Kant calls a dynamical community, such that elements of something like a constellation may be distinguished even as they are unified as simultaneous. The dialectical image is simultaneous rather than successive, but simultaneity is not non-temporal. It is a modality of temporality. Thus, there is no opposition between the temporal and the figural. The constellation is itself the figure of a time determination, and the figure can only be grasped uh, temporally. Of course, Benjamin's theory of the dialectical image does not involve an experience of empirical simultaneity. Rather, it involves the advent of historical simultaneity through the historical index of a sign. In the case of Baudelaire's poem, this sign is a swan suturing the transformation of Paris to the sorrow of Andromache and to the death of Hector. The new carousel is displaced as it is traversed by the power of imagination, such that the memory of what was seen becomes what is seen in the mind's eye. The image rises up in the mind and speaks, in fact, within the present of the poem's articulation, stretching its avid head toward a sky which is ironic because it offers the sensible presentation of what is desired, the blue of the lake, without itself being that object of desire. At the moment of the swan's reported speech in English, water, when will you rain, thunder, when will you boom, the anticipation of the future enters the poem through the temporal language of yearning. When? When? Synthesizing an originary absence, son beau lac natal, um, with a desired future through the imminence of what is imagined to the language of the poem itself, the actual enunciation of the question. So we speak the, the, the swan's question. The swan's desperate question makes the present of the poem as the recollection of the past, in the desperate anticipation of a future that may or may not come to be, the thunder, the rain. Hector, far from the waters for bathing, speaks as Andromache, the unhappy one, um, through the mouth of a swan ventriloquized by the poet in the mind of a reader via the materiality of the signifier, the signe. Heidegger's analysis of historicity elaborates the existential ontological condition of possibility for the coming together of what has been with the now. Quote, this is in italics in the original. It's not me who's getting excited here. It's, it's, uh, it's Heidegger. Um, the analysis of the historicity of Dasein attempts to show that this being is not temporal because it is in history, but that, on the contrary, it exists and can exist historically only because it is temporal in the ground of its being. Such temporality, moreover, must be understood in the sense delivered by Heidegger two chapters earlier in what I regard as the climactic sentence of being in time. Tempor uh, temporality is the primordial outside of itself, in and for itself, Heidegger says. The primordial outside of itself, in and for itself. Time is the being of beings which is not a being. 
insofar as its constitutive exteriority never has the self-identical unity of a substance, but only the unity of a synthesis transpiring through the intersection of the not yet and the already within the horizontal constitution of the present as the in order to. The ecstatical unity of temporality, Heidegger shows, is, quote, the condition of possibility that there can be a being that exists as it's there, right, rather than it's here. Uh, book 22 of the Iliad is a paradigmatic dramatization of such existence, wherein the not yet and the already encounter one another first through anticipation, then in the moment in which Andromache sees Hector's body below the battlements, then as anticipatory mourning for the future of Astyanax. It is the meaning of widowhood that is constructed here, and thus the significance of the name Andromache, the projection of a future bound to what has already happened, yet which will be repeated in fidelity as the meaning of a now that is never here, but always there. And this is what is repeated by the complex rendering of temporal exteriority in Baudelaire's poem. In a seminar on the critique of pure reason, and in Kant and the problem of metaphysics, these two Text, Heidegger pursues the deconstruction of the transcendental unity of apperception that is implicit uh, also this deconstruction throughout being in time. His argument hinges on a reassertion of what he sees suppressed in the second edition of Kant's first critique, the status of imagination as the common root of intuition and understanding. That is the common root of the subject's capacity for both sensible receptivity and productive determination. So pure sensibility and the spontaneity of pure thinking. There is thus a double function of the imagination. Its empirical function is the capacity to produce an image in the absence of an object, just as Baudelaire's speaker sees only in the mind's eye the markets and the menagerie of the Place de Carousel prior to their demolition. But the transcendental function of the imagination is the power to produce conditions of objectivity per se in the first instance. So that is, imagination is itself the power of transcendence which opens the subject to any exteriority at all, which makes it possible to hold any object whatever over against oneself as a determinate being. This is primarily in the, um, in the seminar on, on Kant's first critique when, when Heidegger emphasizes this. Imagination is the condition of possibility at the common root of intuition and understanding for the transcendental constitution of the object equals X prior to the determination of the, of the particularity of any object. That is the faculty of transcendence, of exteriority in the first instance. In his detailed and rigorous reconstruction of the three syntheses in the A edition of Kant's Transcendental Deduction, uh, Heidegger shows, and, and I just have to say this is one of the most, I mean, pristine pieces of philosophy in the, in the whole tradition, in my opinion, this reconstruction of the three syntheses in the, in the seminar on the first critique. Heidegger shows that imagination uh, is not only the faculty which, takes, which makes possible the synthesis of reproduction, um, the second of the, of the three, but that it must also be the ground of the synthesis of apprehension and intuition and the ground of the synthesis of recognition and the concept arguing that this last synthesis should re be renamed, so not recognition, but precognition, um, <clears throat> since it is already implicit as a condition of possibility for the combination of apprehension and reproduction in the constitution of objectivity. That is, it's the opening of objectivity, and therefore what he calls precognition. Thinking through what would have been the case um, for these three syntheses to come what would have to be the case for these three syntheses to come together in what Kant calls an inseparable combination through, again, what he says is the formal condition of the inner sense, namely time, Heidegger reads the three modes of trans transcendental synthesis as correlates of the three ecstasies of temporality, that is, of seizing the present, apprehension, um, of reaching back, reproduction, and of reaching ahead, precognition. It is the horizontal character of subjective temporality which Heidegger reads as at issue in transcendence, the opening of exteriority, and the transcendental synthesis not only of conditions for the experience of an isolated object of an isolated perception, but also the very possibility of any relation to an object at all, and indeed, as Heidegger says, to nature in general. Heidegger's project then, finishing up this part on Heidegger, uh, is to show that the atemporal transcendental unity of apperception cannot be the ground of the unity of the subject, since this renders incoherent um, the relationship of such unity to temporality. 
That is, an opening of the subject to exteriority, which is also the condition of possibility, the unity of subject exteriority. The, the point is, if the, if the I were a, were a atemporal unity, even as a pure form, what is it that would attach that to the form of, of time as the inner sense or as the opening of, of exteriority? The project of being in time, which is, the, I think, the real answer, attempt to answer this question, and not the two Kant books, but being in time as a whole, um, <clears throat> was to show that it is possible to understand the synthesis of a self, a unity of temporal existence and experience without grounding this in the formal condition of an atemporal unity. The upshot of Heidegger's reading of Kant for his project in Being in Time is that, as he puts it in the Kant seminar, the grasping uh, of the temporality of the imagination makes intelligible how existential ontological reflection is possible at all. So here's a quotation um, from the Kant seminar. But if the productive power of imagination is in this way, sorry, but if the productive power of imagination is in this way, nothing but the most original unity of the three modes of synthesis, then this power has essentially already unified in itself pure intuition and pure thinking, pure receptivity and pure spontaneity. Or put more precisely, this power is the root which releases both from out of itself. The productive power of imagination is the root of the faculties of subjectivity. It is the basic constitution of the subject of Dasein itself. Insofar as the power of imagination releases pure time from out of itself, as we have shown, and this means that the power of imagination contains pure time as a possibility, it is original temporality, and therefore the radical faculty of ontological knowledge. The existential constitution of the subject is thus the condition of possibility for knowledge of the being of beings, time. I'm arguing that such an account of the subject renders comprehensible an approach to allegory as what Daman calls the rhetoric of temporality, reconstructed as the rhetoric which figures the very crux of exteriority and synthesis in the transcendental construction of the object equals x. Allegory involves a double movement, a double-folded process of figuration, a movement of subtraction from the empirical to the transcendental, um, and from the particularity of any person, any object, any relation to a generic condition in which those may come to signify any other whatever, as Benjamin puts it. And there's also a movement of figurative determination, so the construction of a parallel level of significance or the assignment of a universal name. My claim is that Heidegger's account of imagination, reconstructing transcendental conditions of exteriority and synthesis, makes intelligible the allegorical operations of substitution, parallelism, and universal, uh, universalization, that is, through the relation between the empirical and the transcendental. As the common root of understanding and intuition, imagination is the common source of the capacity for determination and of the temporal constitution of exteriority, opening the transcendental dimension of what could be called determinability. The temporality of imagination enables displacements of conceptual determination, wherein allegory may draw everything, everything becomes allegory, back to transcendental conditions of determinability and then reassign their sense. When Baudelaire's speaker, immersed in the stasis of melancholy, declares that everything becomes allegory, it seems to be in this, it seems to be this transcendental field of determinability in which he is immersed, where the empirical is exposed to the implicit determinations of another scene, which will come to be articulated in the poem. But why would melancholy have this effect? Because melancholy is a psychic structure productive of a particular stimmung, an attunement to the ungrounding of origin to an abyss of loss exposing the ungroundedness of the subject and indeed of nature, which is implicit in the intemporality per se, the absolute outside of itself in and for itself. Melancholy is an attunement through loss to that form of exteriority. Melancholy is a subjective attunement toward the inextricability of temporal synthesis and temporal exteriority the exposure of subjective unity and conditions of objectivity to an outside that only holds together through the synthesis of the already and the not yet, which binds the self as a structure already outside itself, such that cherished memories may seem exterior elements more weighty than rocks. 
The structure of temporal exteriority of throne projection is precisely what we find in Book 22 of the Iliad, where Andromache becomes what she already is, the widow, through a scene of delayed recognition traversed by proleptic anticipation, whereby she hopes that what she says may never come close to her ear. Through an attunement to loss, Melancholy attunes the subject to a strange play of indetermination and determination operating between transcendental and empirical levels. Um, to the ungroundedness of both subjective and objective synthesis, and attunes us to the power of the empirical imagination to produce figures in the absence of an object. For example, the double image of Andromache and the swan. Or, through the subtraction of the concrete determinacy, of concrete determinacy, at the switching point of the transcendental, the name of the concept or the universal may be stamped by the figurative power of imagination, such that memories become the allegorical figure of memory, with a capital M. This encounter takes place where exposure to originary temporality is experienced as mood and as a structural disposition of the subject. What I mean to formulate are the ontological existential conditions of possibility for Benjamin's thinking of allegory in the Trauerspiel book or of Demand's analysis of allegory as the rhetoric of temporality, or of a theory like Jameson's in which, I guess I don't have this, no, um, in which he says, allegory raises its head as a solution when beneath this or that seemingly stable or unified reality, the tectonic plates of deeper contradictory levels of the real shift and grate ominously against one another and demand a representation, or at least an acknowledgment. Uh, which they are unable to find in the shine or illusory surfaces of existential or social life. This is when allegory wells up for Jameson. These theories require, I think, a transcendental theory of imagination such as that offered by Heidegger's reading of Kant, a theory of both how we are open to historicity at all and of why this openness to historicity can be experienced as figurative. And they require a theory of the unity of the self synthesized through temporal disjunction, such as that author offered in Being and Time. So how then does this bring us to understand differently what is at stake in allegory as a rhetorical trope and as a mode of melancholic intuition? It enables us, I think, to recognize that allegory is not only the rhetoric of temporality, but also the rhetoric of the ontological difference. Time is the being of beings, which is not a being. It is the movement of exteriority, the disjunctive synthesis of the already and the not yet, which divides all beings from self-identity, even as it enables their, their temporal determinacy, and which is the condition of possibility for openness to the receptivity of, of beings in general. Melancholy is an attunement to this ex constitutive exteriority, to the not a being of the being of beings. Um, to the negativity of time, of finitude, of death and loss. It is an attunement that interrupts the work of mourning, that is cathected to loss through sorrow, and that holds within the heart's core the absence of what is desired through memory. In a word, melancholy is an attunement to being as exile, the key theme of Baudelaire's poem, as the being outside itself of any determinate being which determines it as other than itself, which subjects it to suffering and which opens it to tragedy. It's this ontological level of reflection that delivers the extraordinary power of allegorical synthesis achieved by Baudelaire's poem, in which whoever has lost what can never be found uh, are gathered into the community of sorrow and commemorated by memory through the figure of Andromache. Last page. The relation between melancholy and allegory thus involves an understanding of allegory as the rhetoric and perceptual modality of this uh, attunement to constitutive exteriority, which potentially grasps any particular thing as something other. Allegory implies as a kind of substructure the transcendental power of imagination which produces through temporal exteriority and temporal synthesis the openness of receptivity, the power to constitute determinate objects of perception, and the power to transform these in the mind's eye into something else through the negativity of their temporal constitution. Understood as the rhetoric of the ontological difference, allegory or the rhetoric of temporality might be figured as a double-folded fabric, diplacas, woven with elaborate figures whose composition is exposed to incompletion. If imagination is the faculty of ontological knowledge, then fundamental ontology is not only a philosophical discourse on the being of beings, it also enables us to grasp how and why it might be that the beings we encounter 
may be transmuted into signs and transformed by imagination, conceived anew through rhetorical operations of literature that redouble the empirical and that disjoin the immediacy of presence, uh, weaving together the ancient and the modern and ineluctably folding figures of what we cannot see into every experience of what is right before our eyes, just like so. This little stream, poor and sad mirror, where once reflected the immense majesty of your widow's grief, this duplicitous simoise swelled by your tears, suddenly made fecund my fertile memory as I was crossing the new carousel. Thanks. <laughs>